and so th- those are the things that I I kind of learn. I'm I'm not the uh, you know the consultant <laughs> type. Um, I just go into a situation and I don't know. A lot of times, like there's a guy who came when we were growing really fast in the beginning from China or something. He came, maybe it was Korea, and asked, you know, how did you guys grow so quickly? And I told him, I don't think you're gonna like my answer. Um, we we prayed a lot. And we had a, a mission, and we stuck to it. And, but we prayed a lot, and uh, yeah, I could tell he was really disappointed. It was like, you know, give us the three things or the ten things or whatever. But anyways, <laughs> maybe I'm going off. No, one of the things that that I've discovered over the years is that people are always uh, <laughs> they're looking for help, and they want it to be complicated. Uh, they they want it to be new and fresh. And usually they want it to be expensive because then they, they attribute value to it. And uh, the, I think the secret to what we've done has always been just keep it really relational. Keep the, in, in my mind, the Hope Chapel culture. And we did grow. We, we, we grew fast and, and we grew some real big churches. Uh, you know, I've written a book on micro church. So everybody thinks all the churches we started are micro churches. But we got s- several of them that are in the thousands. Mostly we started churches around 150. But the, the core to me was uh, keep, keep the, the Bible center, um, kind of teaching through the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Keep it linked to the people. I'd always try to tell, start every sermon with a story from the congregation, best we could. And then we had a, a, a tool, you know, what we called mini church for bringing people into small groups and linking that to the sermon. But the issue was two things at that level. One is we're building relationships, I guess three things. Two, you declare yourself. You, you know, this is what God said to me. This is what I'm going to do. So there's a kind of accountability. But we were that's where we trained all these guys to lead people. Right. And if, if a guy would start two or three mini churches, you know, raising a disciple, that was the other part of our DNA. Everybody had to, to always have somebody ready. If you drop dead, this person steps in your shoes. And uh, th- those elements of culture are so simple uh, that, like you said, the guy from, from Korea, China, wherever he was from, uh, was looking for something fancier than we were. And uh, one of the things that frustrates me is um, everybody wants to blow out of smoke about how many churches got started and all that kind of stuff. But then they, then they, they want to look to somebody else for how do I do it. You know, some guy started one church and he's got a cool website. And so we're going to learn from that guy. But it's like, this isn't hard. It doesn't, it isn't rocket science and it doesn't take a lot of money. Um, just, you know, respond to the things I just said from, from your vantage point. I, I guess, I guess one of the things that, um, like you, you said, you know, the mini church was used to train people. And, and um, I know, after you, 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 you give your little spew, you know, if I said that to someone, they go, okay, but, but you know, where, do you, where did you guys train them? Uh, pretty much out there. It was like on-the-job type training. Um, and, like, how, how do you train a guy that the uh, first time they're going to meet in a small group and, um, you know, this is their very first meeting and he decides that the girls go in one room and the guys will be in one room and we'll we'll just you know have fellowship we'll talk about the sermon or whatever is on your mind and then afterwards pray and then we'll come back together again um and 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 the the guy who was the leader the first thing he he asked the very first guy so hey you know what happened this week that maybe you need prayer for or or something that you want to you know praise god for or whatever and the guy goes well i i committed adultery and it was like huh I was I was in that mini church. I was sitting there going, "What the heck?" And it's like, um, what better way to train somebody than on the spot and something that big? You would think, "Oh, this has to forget it. We just gotta um, uh, we'll we'll take it to the higher ups." But at that very moment, you got to do something. And I'll tell you, everybody in that room just started. <laughs> To say, well, well, I think probably we should pray for one, 
And and then everybody tried to. Uh, well, first we. I remember one guy says, "I think we should move our group a little further away from the ladies." Because <laughs> someone asks, "Does your wife know?" He goes, "No." And we go, oh, "Okay." So we moved them. So that was kind of like trial by fire. But but he learned something. The guy that was leading the group. Okay, the man that confessed this. A lot of the things as we prayed was to, you need to tell her. Just get it out and get it over with. Um, it was, what, six or seven years later, I met the guy. He came to Hawaii again. He was a military guy. And he asked me to, to go out to dinner with him and his family, which was his wife. And at that time, he had no children. He had three children now. And he tells me, and the wife tells Thank you so much for what happened to us during that time. It was a rough time, but you guys stayed with us. Well, how do you train for that? I, I mean, I suppose you could you could have some so, something somewhat insignificant to me. It's better that you're doing it that way. And I think a lot of what we did was like that because we didn't have a course that said, if something like that happens, here's what you do. So what it left was a wide open door for the Holy Spirit to use your gifts or the guys that were in that group, their gifts, to minister to this guy. And we saw, you know, the hand of God working. Um, so, um, yeah, when you're saying, when you're talking, that's the thing that I thought. Well, you know, as, as you're telling the story, there are people who are listening to this who are in stark terror or, or, <laughs> they're, or they're, they're, they're dismissing us because we didn't do enough and, you know, whatever. Um, what what needs to really be understood is the context, the values, the, the knowledge of the scripture. You know, I grew up as a kid in church, and I'd hear a wonderful sermon on the weekend and want to go tell my friends about it, but I couldn't remember the third point, so I would shut up. And then I, I, I heard Chuck Smith in Calvary Chapel talking about how he just talked his way through the Bible so that the people would know the Bible and know where to find the help they needed. And so that was kind of the, for me, the cornerstone of everything we did in, in teaching. And then, you know, we read a lot of books with those mini church pastors. We, we had them in small groups reading and really almost running another mini church around whatever it was that we're reading. So there was a lot of material going into them, but there was never courses. Uh, one, one of the things we didn't do is, you know, here's six lessons in this, and, and here's eight classes you got to go to. We, we didn't do that. It was, it was on the job, and it was, it was continuous. You know, if you're, <clears throat> there's one guy that was, um, I'm not going to name him, but he was a, a graduate of Fuller Seminary, uh, moved to Hawaii about the same time we did, <clears throat> had been our friend in the mainland, and uh, got involved with, a, he took the, an associate pastor job in a, in a church that was pastored by a guy that was a little loopy and uh, eventually lost his job and it, and it wasn't his fault. But uh, one thing led to another and he was kind of, he went through some hard times, but um, he, he ended up working with us and he, he stayed with us the whole duration. And, you know, at one point, and I don't even remember how many years ago this was, but he came to me and said, you know, as long as I've been with you guys, I've read far more books than I ever read while I was at Fuller. And uh, at that point, it was 70 some odd books because he kept them all because we bought the books for everybody. And so he tells us about, <laughs> you made me read way more than those guys made me read. And, and I think sometimes when we talk about Hope Chapel and the culture, uh, we, we kind of tend to underplay some of the things that were really, really stand out and important things to us. One of the things that I remember really fondly is uh, the, all those mornings meeting at the zoo with our staff to go surfing. And, uh, you know, we all had, at least I did, I had these dreams of we'll all, you know, get buy condos in Waikiki when we're old and, and go out there every morning. And of course that never happened, but there was this kind of camaraderie that, that went on and it, and it permeated the church. Um, Talk to that. You know, uh, um, before I do, he's right. There's a tendency, like this is this is the 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 Ralph and Aaron kind of thing. Um, I'll play down 
some of the education that I got. Um, I never was a reader, but he forced me to read, like like he said, more books than I've, I've ever seen. Like you see, if you look in the background, you see all them. It feels like I read that many of them with him and the rest of the guys. So there was always this education. And now every one of those books, I don't know if they're Christian bestsellers. I, I would say some of them are, some of them aren't. And that is what um, Ralph did with us, was he gave us um, sometimes, and I hope I'm not putting down the Christian church, because, I mean, it is the body of Christ. But we get kind of like, uh, my, uh, what do you call it? A, a, like a, a microscope. Yeah. And we look at things through a microscope. And we, we shield ourselves from anything on the outside. I mean, one of the books that you'll hear come up from time to time with us is In Search of Excellence. That wasn't one of the Christian bestsellers. Um, it was a business book. But inside of there, there were so many things of value that you would be missing by just considering it, oh, it's not a Christian book. I don't want nothing to do with it. Um, and so, um, yeah, there, there was all kinds of reading. There was um, training. It wasn't just throw you out there. Um, but, but, yeah, so that's, that's the difference between he and I. I'll talk about how easy it is because, frankly, I want to see more guys go out there because I, I, I think there are things that you have that have been God-given gifts, and you're afraid to use them because – Somebody has made you afraid of using them. Um, R Ralph would put me up there every once in a while to preach. And the thing that I feared the most was reading out loud because there was a teacher named Mrs. Tooley. I remember her name <laughs> back in about the fifth grade that made me read out loud. And I wasn't good at reading out loud. And she made sure I remembered that I wasn't good at it. And that stuck to me. So every time I get up, and I have to start reading, I start getting all messed up. <laughs> and anyways, uh, and, and, I, and I still do. Uh, I still use her as the excuse, too. We, we had or still have this ability to look at the way things are now and find a way through it and to find sometimes a different way through it. Um, that that's never changed. We've been always very flexible. You know, here's what we've done, but we're not glued to that. If if there's a problem like COVID, there are, are ways around it. And, and like even this morning, I was talking to my dentist about what is his church going to do now that COVID's here. Um, and then I asked him, "You're you're a young guy. Are you going to go back?" He says, well, I'm not sure. It's comfortable now. And he, and he and I talked about, you know, the church that we knew before. You know, I mean, before, right? It's four months ago. Um, was like a cruise ship. And everybody was enjoying the cruise ship and everything else. Um, but now, that vessel, I was telling him, you know, cruise ships are really good. They're nice. I, I've been on a couple of cruises. Um, they're nice. But the problem is, is they, do, they do have to dock. And then at that point, they have to let the people off. Or they have to find another means. Like when we went to Venice, the cruise ship didn't go down the canal. It's a bit big for that. So you have to get on another smaller vessel. Um, the church has to realize that right now they have to mount those smaller vessels. They have to find those smaller vessels to reach the community because the community can't go nowhere. They're out there somewhere. And we need another vehicle to get them get to those folks that are out there. We still need to evangelize. We just got to find a new way to do it. And it's not, I mean, it, some of it will be, oh, come and watch the TV program because it's, it's I guess, non-threatening in a way. But, but some of the problems that we had as, a, as a, a cruise ship type church is that if I'm a visitor, some of the worship, uh, I... I don't know how to engage that. I know how to engage it because I was once in the cruise ship. But now that it's virtual, I don't know how to engage it. So who knows? Maybe that needs to disappear or get less. And we create this thing like 
the thing this morning, I got up and thought, you know what? Our enemy, he would, he would devise a new way to, to, to hurt us during COVID. Um, the Christian church needs to do something to use the COVID thing to, to multiply itself. And, and it's almost like we're stuck with the, uh, um, you know, R- Ralph is a big historian, so I, I got to be careful. But the, uh, the cotton, the, during the Civil War, how they fought was they got in these two lines and they shot at each other. And then maybe sometimes when they ran out of ammunition, they would ban at each other. And there was this Contrell guy or somebody, this, this guy who created these raiders that would go around. Why not? If you got two lines, why not go around and shoot them from behind? Uh, it's a war. We want to win it. It's like the church needs to be like that guy. We got to come up with another plan or different ways of doing things. Or, or keep, keep this one if you need to and if you have to. But come up with another smaller group that can do this, this sort of raider party thing. Um, because it is. It is a war. And we do want to win. Well, actually, you know what? We really do win. Um, but in the midst of it, um, I, I want to still see guys who have abilities to lead to lead. Um, and we had a gal that we had been uh, meeting with uh, in our Zoom mini church. And she's now leading another group separate from ours. And in fact, she doesn't even um, come to our Zoom group. And that's what you want because she's out there doing ministry, evangelizing others um, without, uh, we didn't have to say, okay, we, we give you the certificate or pray over you. Um, God already kind of did that. We just kind of pushed a bit, help push her and get her going. Anyhow, <laughs> sorry. I, That's I went really off. good. You know, um, it, it, I don't know where we want to go down this path real far, but you know, we start a bunch of churches in Japan and there's a there's a, a woman who uh, she and her husband were part of one, the biggest one that we ever planted uh, when when it first went off, and then uh, he let her down. He got involved with somebody else. They ended up having a divorce, and and uh, I, I didn't see her for years. And and we saw her in in the church at Fumichito Pastors Crossroad in Nishinomiya. And I know that Fumi is somebody that you have spent a lot of time and energy discipling. Uh, he's like a spiritual son to you. He would say you're his spiritual father. But um, uh, Randy Ishida, who is in your mini church in Hawaii, uh, has been kind of coaching and discipling and mentoring her off of Zoom. And now she started a little church. And, and this is really kind of how easy it is. Somebody who's, whose life was broken uh, she's very successful as a businesswoman now. Uh, Randy, who's tried with a motorcycle gang, I think works in a grocery store, is uh, is able to use the, the tools that are there and just because he knows how to think differently. And it, it, it seems to be that that's that this kind of group think that the church engages in. And, you know, you, you mentioned the best-selling Christian books. I usually tend to read the best-selling Christian books about four or five years after they were hot because I want to see if they, if they endure. And I, I'd far rather get people reading history books or uh, especially history books or, you know, getting into the Bible itself than uh, some of the stuff that I see as, as fluff. But I, again, it comes back to what you're talking about, this ability to, to take the values that we learn from the scripture and apply them to the culture. And right now the culture is pretty messed up. 